All right, shall we uh, get going? So uh, just a reminder, we have only one lecture this week. Because I, again, I could not get the room on Wednesday. Uh, but it, it works out well because next week is sort of a unit. And we'll talk about light and reflection. Again, a lot of theory on Monday. And then the practical applications, which is lighting for photography, including flash, on Wednesday. Uh, okay, so before we start, today. Uh, here are some best pictures from the still life competition. Uh, sorry, from the still life assignment. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, so Florian Kainz on caustics. Um, seen lots of caustics coming off of glasses, but I think this is something unusual. Looks like a leaf on water. Uh, very nice. Uh, Dmitry Kovalov on a portrait of two objects. Um, it struggles a little bit maybe for depth of field in a couple of places, but it's just a lovely black and white portrait. I love the gray tones. It reminds me of that Ansel Adams still life that we talked about where the gray tones were very carefully uh, organized. Uh, Alice Liu, uh, her still life on Vanitas. Um, those are terrifying masks. Notice there's a skull there. Um, and Florian Kainz on Vanitas in the style of a Vanitas painting. So he's got the candle there in the back left. And looks like the hourglass is out of time and those roses are wilted. It's really quite a tour de force. Um, so it's really interesting in th this case to read his description of it, because he talks about a lot of production stuff he had to go through, including the fact that he didn't have this many gold coins. And so he took a number of shots with the gold coins in different positions and then composited them together. <laughs> so this is really quite a, uh, quite a, uh, a construction. Uh, it's also interesting to look at how we photographed it. So this is another version of that Vanitas. And for this one, he included in his submission the setup. Notice the uh, mask. And I don't know if you can quite see it, but the mullions, in order to produce the, mullion, the Dutch conceit on uh, two slides ago. Um, but not everything that Florian does works out. Here's an attempt to do caustics that set the leaf on fire. <laughs> he took this picture presumably before putting out the fire. And then I think uh, uh, his uh, um, glass sphere then rolled onto the concrete floor and that was the end of caustics. Uh, all right, Dmitry Kovalov, suspended object. Very nice. 787 coming in the window. Um, seems like we're devolving to a two horse race here. Uh, Alice again, uh, suspended objects, prelude to tea time. Uh, I should have included the picture. She had a very nice picture of the strings that were suspending the teacups, which were then removed. And once again, Florian's, Florian with precarious. Okay, great pictures. I love this still life assignment. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, history of photography again, and in particular photography as a tool. And so here's what we'll talk about. We'll talk first about the technology. So I'll kind of squeeze all that into the beginning. And then we'll talk about the popularization of photography and then a number of uses of photography as a tool for documenting, um, for uh, documenting industry as well as science, uh, for documenting the social scene. And then we'll kind of segue from that into one uh, sidebar uh, which, or profile on the photographers of the Farm Service Administration. And that's a particular high point in the history of photography, uh, in particular in its use as a social tool. And it will lead eventually to the iconic or the flagship image for this course, which is Dorothea Lange's migrant mother. Uh, okay, so let's start with technology. Uh, dry plate photography was developed somewhat after the wet plate photography that we considered earlier from Matthew Brady in the Civil War. Um, don't worry so much about the chemistry of hardened gel uh, gelatin silver bromide. The key is that the exposure time now could be under a second and that the plates could be stored, which separated the process of shooting from the process of processing. 
So you didn't need to carry a tent with you anymore. But the real advance came just a little bit later in paper roll film. So paper roll film is again a gelatin, but in this, t in this case coated onto paper, which could then be rolled up. And uh, the exposures were now under a tenth of a second. So it was even more sensitive. And so you could take multiple pictures without fiddling. So once the exposures get under a tenth of a second, this, this method that I show you for the Petzval lens of just kind of covering it no longer worked. You needed real shutters. And so there had to be a parallel development in shutter technology. And this, uh, dem this illustration here shows both kinds. It shows what they call a roller blind shutter, which is the forerunner of today's focal plane shutter. And it shows the diaphragm shutter, which because of its action should be in the lens plane, not at the film plane, because it's not instantaneous and would otherwise vignette the picture as it, uh, because it's not open for the entire time. Okay. So these developments all led to sort of the breakthrough moment in photography, which was the invention of the Kodak camera. So this is uh, George Eastman, Kodak number one. I actually have an antique that I forgot to bring from Stanford, so I can't show it to you. Um, it's a fixed focus, single shutter speed, hundredth of a second, I think. Um, produced actually circular images when it first came out. It's a very strange camera. Oh, by the way, the word Kodak was George Eastman's Kodak. Sort of like, like the camera clicking Kodak. Uh, that's the origin of the word. Uh, you got 100 shots per roll, and then you mailed the entire camera back. They took out the film, they processed it, and they sent you back the camera with new film in it. Uh, you press the button, we do the rest. So the key here is not a single invention. This is just a compendium of technologies that existed. It's a system, or what we, we would now call an ecosystem. And that was really the breakthrough. And this was happening a lot in the late 19th century that people were beginning to discover in industrial inventions that the key was to put together a system. Perhaps the most famous system, just to take a short uh, tangent here, is Edison's lighting system, which again wasn't a single invention, although obviously his patent for the incandescent light bulb was foundational. But the first lighting system where he lit up a square mile of New York City had in it a lot of different components. So he had to invent every single one of these components. Uh, so similar in that respect to Kodak's system. Of course, as we know uh, as engineers, he got one part of it wrong, which was direct versus alternating current. So Nikola Tesla's alternating current was the right answer. Westinghouse had that technology. And Edison fought it for the rest of his life. Uh, all right, so back to photography. So there were a number of other technologies uh, that were important. The first was the dye industry, the chemistry industry uh, in Germany, actually, in the 1870s. Because what it was leading to was pure dyes and pure chemicals that could be used in photography. And that was um, improving the uh, it was reducing the exposure time and improving uh, the quality of the imagery. Uh, in 1880, flash photography using flash powder, platinum paper printing. So there aren't too many vestiges of analog or film photography that are still worth talking about now in the 21st century, but platinum is still one of them because it's a printing technique that makes a physical thing you can look at that looks a lot different. Uh, you have to really see one of these things in person. It's a... Um, uh, it's uh, platinum, which is slightly sensitive to light, uh, that is put as a powder on the outside. So there's no emulsion. It's not mixed in with a glossy surface. So it's a matte surface, but it has a very deep black. And that combination gives it a unique appearance. And that also makes it very good at showing intermediate gray tones on top of that deep black. And it really has this almost silvery appearance when you look at a a platinum print. Um, and then finally, I'll mention half toning. So this is the first newspaper photograph. It happens just to be an advertisement for space in a building. Um, but uh, the technique was uh, revolutionary. So the idea is let's take a photograph and turn it into something you can do just with black ink on white paper. 
And so I mentioned half toning earlier in the course. Here's the process. So what I did, uh, just for the fun of it, was I tried to simulate it in Photoshop using a bunch of steps. There's actually a half toning button, but I wanted to break it down into the individual steps so that I could show it to you. So you take uh, an original, you take the negative of that I just inverted in Photoshop, and then you screen it. And so they would actually have a physical screen with holes in it uh, like this. And they would focus the image onto the screen, but then place either a paper or another negative, some photosensitive surface, not at that depth, but deeper. And so the result is, instead of getting that on the paper, you'd get that. In other words, it would be blurred. And then if they, uh, what I did in Photoshop is I thresholded, but if they then developed that with extreme contrast, they would get these um, round, uh, round circles of different sizes. And the size would be proportional to the original uh, intensity or the inversion of that, and then they could invert it again. So we've now converted half tone or gray scale level into a size of a circle. This was now suitable for printing. And so the standard technique at the time was an intaglio etching process where you would have a copper plate, you would lay down some resist, you would expose actually this one onto it, uh, eat away wherever it had exposed, leaving a pit. And so you now had a flat plate with pits in it. And then you could uh, pour ink over it, clean it off, and so you would end up with ink just in these depressions, in these pits. And then you could lay down a piece of paper and print. And so that was called a photogravor if it was flat or a rotogravor technique if it was a roller. And so it allowed mass production of photographs for the first time. Okay, right, of course, this is now replaced by digital half toning, even for newspapers. They don't go through all of this technique. All right, a few more technologies. We talked about the Petzval lens. Uh, in the 1850s and the fact that it gave you f3.7, which was several f-stops better than what was common before that by correcting a bit better for aberrations. So you can still buy this Petzval lens and put it on your modern Canon camera. And so this is all part of a movement that as budding photographers or accomplished photographers, you should all get to know, which is called lamography. If you've never heard it, look it up. It's it came from a Viennese art school movement in the 1990s, I think. Um, and it basically means experimental art photography. And so it typically meant analog cameras and film. It meant cheap cameras with all of their aberrations. Let's use them creatively. And so here's a, a picture from microsites.lamography.com taken with the Petzval 85 art lens. So. What's wrong with that lens? So you're defining it as wrong. <laughs> <laughs> From the point of view of aberrations or other artifacts, what creates that very strange? The bokeh is very strange. Is it astigmatism? I don't think it is astigmatism. It is probably vignetting in the bokeh. So I showed you this before, these cat eye. If you take, I don't have a lens with me, but if you take a lens and it's got uh, an aperture in there and you look at it from, the, from near the edge of the field of view, um, it will, the, the two circles will do this. The two sides of the aperture effectually will do this and create a cat eye. And that cat eye will increase with position away from the center and uh, be radial with it. And so I believe that's what that is. Uh, so Zalman is saying it, it isn't necessarily a characteristic of Petzval lenses, but showed up in some of them. I, indeed, I think there's some controversy about this uh, lens, which I believe is made in Russia. Not that that is necessarily the reason, but that it may or may not be truly representative of the Petzval lens. And of course, the fact that it's being put on this particular camera could also lead to vignetting that wasn't present in the original Petzval use of the lens. We've taken the one thing out of yeah, yeah, it's a little bit out of context, exactly. All right. 
All right, back, back, to, the, back to the history. Um, so some other developments, so there's the Petzval lens. In the 1890s, anastigmatic lens, which is a fancy way of saying that they had pretty much corrected all the aberrations to the point where it was now diffraction limited. Uh, and so um, that could lead to really nice looking photographs, of course. The, the Leica one is that one, 35 millimeter camera with an anastigmat lens. Uh, the photo, uh, photoelectric meter, zoom lenses for cinema, that's what this is over here. This is actually not the camera, this is just the lens. And so when I say zoom lenses, I mean a variable zoom. Uh, and then zoom lenses for still cameras, and then autofocus. So this is the first uh, consumer SLR with autofocus. So remember, this is a film camera. So if it's got an autofocus system, that means that it has to have a separate uh, sensor, of course, uh, as do SLRs now, but it's also, it, it actually has it down here, I think. Okay. Few more, mass market digital camera, the Apple Quick Take. I had one of those. It took pictures, <laughs> that's all I could say for it. And um, the first digital SLR. Uh, so did you work on that or you know something about it? That was before my time. Before so your time, I right. Know quite a bit. I know all the people who did it. Right, right, Peter Sherman. Um, the son okay. of the person who worked on that worked here at Google. Uh, the son of the person who worked on that worked here at right. Google, okay. Uh, so this is, I guess, a disk drive down there, or something like that. Um, and Photoshop. So these are the Knoll brothers. John Knoll uh, now works at Industrial Light and Magic, and so he did the special effects on Star Wars and Pirates of the Caribbean. Thomas Knoll um, wrote uh, Adobe Camera Raw, which uh, Zalman was the tech lead on for many years. This is cute. Those, that's from Photoshop 1. Those are still the icons, more or less. All right. So a little bit more toward the history of photography. So these technological developments led to the popularization of photography. So before, photographers had to be craftsmen, and it took uh, a long time to make a picture. The Kodak camera changed all that, and photography became casual, spontaneous, and popular. <coughs> and so you could begin to really concentrate on everyday life. Uh, you could take candid shots. The word snapshot was actually invented by Herschel, the same guy who invented the word photography. Uh, privacy uh, became uh, an issue. It is still an issue. And women started taking pictures. Um, I know that doesn't sound politically correct, but that is historically what happened. And so the subjects changed. Uh, there's an interesting philosophical essay by Walter Benjamin that talks about the rise of photography and cinematography. So let me quote a little bit from it. So what Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin said is um, an original artwork had an aura. And the uh, aura is the reverence one would experience when in the presence of an original artwork. An example would be Michelangelo's David. So when I was in Italy digitizing Michelangelo's David, people would line up for hours to see the original. But there's a copy that is a marble copy in the Piazza Signoria that is so good that it takes an expert to distinguish between them. But no one pays any attention to that. The pigeons poop on it. Uh, but people line up for hours to see the original. So the original really mattered. Um, according to Benjamin, this aura arises not from the work itself, but from external attributes like its known line of ownership, its restricted exhibition, its publicized authenticity, and its cultural value. So aura is thus indicative, I'm quoting, of art's traditional association with power, magic, and ritual. So that sounds about right. So now what happened with photography? And in particular, in his day, what happened with cinematography? Where there was mechanical reproduction of the work of art, and there was no original, or the original made no difference at all. And so what Benjamin, Walter Benjamin said is, the experience of art is freed from place and ritual and instead brought under the gaze and control of the masses, leading to a shattering of the aura. For the first time in world history, Benjamin wrote, mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. 
what political persuasion was Walter Benjamin? <laughs> Communist. Remember, this is 1935. Communist revolutionary. But what he's saying is, is true, in a sense. It separates the aura of the original work of art from what you are looking at. And this, of course, that's true for digital photography and even more so for the internet. Uh, all right. So enough on uh, technology and generalities. Let's start talking about history. So documenting the growth of America. There's the dome of the Capitol when it was being built. And there's what it looked like a little bit later, 1906. The Washington Monument. So it sat unfinished for many years, including during the Civil War, and then was finally continued later. And even today, if you look at it, about 150 feet up, you can still see, where's my cursor? There it is. That's the change in stone in the first building uh, segment versus the second. The growth of the railroads. That looks like a terribly skinny viaduct <laughs> near Ithaca, New York. The push west uh, in somewhere in Oklahoma. So that's what western towns actually look like. This one's interesting. This is the um, opening of the Cherokee Strip. So let's see. The history here is the Cherokee Indians, along with other nations, were pushed west uh, along what was called the Trail of Tears in the 1830s. They were settled in an area known as the Cherokee Strip, which is right near the panhandle of Oklahoma. So the panhandle sticks out over here. Texas is, is down here. And due to land pressures, um, they finally decided the heck with those treaties. We're going to open this land for settlement. And so they declared a certain day on which there would be literally a land rush. And people set up a quick camp at the starting gate. And here they are milling around just before the cannon is fired. And here it is after they fired the cannon. <laughs> there was literally a land rush. And the idea is you had to go find a piece of land and squat on it. I think there was a lot of cheating. People that snuck in there by another route before made it look like they had panting horses. I'm not sure how it was done. Um, all right. So photography as a proof of achievement. This very famous photograph, of course. The idea that if it wasn't photographed, it didn't happen. And so uh, the Wright brothers are there. Orville's at the controls. Wilbur's running alongside. And this picture was actually taken by members of a local life-saving uh, company uh, because they knew that at this age, they needed photographic proof of that first flight. Italy, and so back to just sort of documenting Italy, uh, uh, sorry, industry and commerce. Um, waterfront in St. Louis. So what's this? The Brooklyn Bridge under construction in 1881. How about this? Statue of Liberty, very good. Under construction in uh, Bartholdi's um, Parisian workshop, and there it is fully completed and assembled in Paris, just to make sure all the pieces fit together before they then took it back apart and shipped it across the ocean. How about this? What is it? Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower, very good. So this is a very famous sequence of photographs taken from roughly the same viewpoint, showing the stages of construction of the Eiffel Tower. So no one had, any, had ever built anything this large before. Many people thought it was impossible. And so they photographed every stage so that they would have a record when the thing collapsed. Um, it was, there was a, a surprising amount of controversy about the construction of this thing. Uh, people thought that it would become a magnet and attract all the nails in Paris. Uh, other people thought that it would become a lightning rod and that the lightning would change Parisian we weather. Neither happened. And after the fair in 1889, they left it there, as we know. So another gigantic undertaking, what was this? Panama Canal. Panama Canal. Very good. So um, it's nice to 
follow that one with this because Gustav Eiffel was one of the engineers along with Ferdinand Lesseps on a French effort to build a, a uh, sea level canal which failed. They were unable to make a sea level canal. Finally, the whole thing was sold to the United States in 1904. Theodore Roosevelt continued it as a lock-based canal with a rise of 85 feet. And that made it a little bit more practical to get through the Continental Divide. It was the largest project uh, ever undertaken, the most expensive project in US history. Let's see, the Eiffel Tower was uh, 1.5 million, so $34 million in today's uh, dollars. The Panama Canal was 370 million at the time, which is now $8 billion. The really large project. Um, the Apollo program in today's dollars was 120 billion, so it was, it was still more. 75,000 workers, uh, 5,000 of which died of yellow fever. That's another dramatic story. But it was a very important development because what it allowed was uh, it allowed um, ships to avoid going around Cape Horn. And that was important because Cape Horn was a nasty place. So imagine trying to do a photograph like that with a, a wet plate photographic process. This was obviously done with a snapshot camera. Uh, it's almost impossible to believe that the weather was this nasty. But there's, uh, this is a little tangential from photography, but there's an absolutely unique movie uh, of this era. And it is this magical overlap of the period of cinematography and the period of square masted riggers. And there's only one movie like this that is known. Let me play that movie for you. It's really cool. And hopefully it will play. A week or 10 days, nothing more than a couple of mile an hour breeze, flat calm here. And uh, even though I'd made all these wishes in the northern part of Ireland, but finally it came. It had to eventually and came up with a big blast, sent us scurrying to the sails. There's 40 men furling one sail, the foresail here, and they're not up there playing tiddlywinks. There's 20 men out on the starboard side with body and soul lashings on, and 20 more men out on the port side, body and soul lashings on because the buttons are not strong enough to hold your oilskins against the storm. Winds getting up over 100 miles an hour later on. But you put lashings around your waist, around your ankles, around your wrists, and around your neck to hold the oilskins on. Not to keep dry, but to keep it a little bit warmer in the blast of freezing cold air. Snow every month of the year. We got snowball fights around the deck. The two fellows just coming into the picture at the right here now were washed overboard uh, on the way home. Uh, that means two empty bunks. And nothing is said about it. It's all very quiet. Now, you must be on the ball at all times and get yourself out of the way of a big wave coming roaring across because there's not time for somebody to tell you how to go about it. You wind yourself up on some wire or, or the or lifeline that's specially put up there for the purpose from the windward side because otherwise you get bashed away from whatever you're trying to hang on to. Pictures from the top of the mast now, 17 stories high. And when I showed these pictures the in London, I lectured the to the Honorable Company of Master Mariners, where every single man in the audience was a square rigger skipper or retired. And they said afterwards, not a man in the audience, and we represent three to 4,000 times around Cape Horn, has ever seen that much water across the deck of a vessel that has not sunk. Can we get a copy for the British Museum? So I get a copy in the British Museum. I thought, what can a young fellow do to get something in the British Museum? It's incredible, but there's no other pictures taken under these circumstances ever taken and never will. There's no more loaded square riggers. This is storm number two. In between the storms, you set sail. And you're going to see the, the, the ocean down here in the third storm looking like the bottom of Niagara Falls. The whole wa water just blowing horizontally now. Just, uh, just, it uh, can't sit down. It's blowing so fast. You're up over 90 now, and uh, the next storm will, will bring it over 100 miles an hour, just screaming, 350 lines, screaming like you never, like you're torturing animals to death. The noise is fantastic. Setting that force, you saw 40 men furling. A button has been caught there. But in between the storms, the water, wind goes down off into an absolute flat calm. It makes it a very difficult place to sail around. But it's not all storms. Now, nobody writes about smooth water. Well, what is there to say about it? No wind, period. Now watch this. The bottom. Uh, 
you to know who that is. Isn't that an amazing movie? It's an absolutely unique movie. There's only one like that. Uh, okay. Suddenly, Florian almost setting the leaf on fire doesn't seem quite so heroic. <laughs> <laughs> right. These men were very brave. Now, if you're interested in a book, I recommend Two Years Before the Mast by, by uh, Dana. It's uh, one of the books of the Harvard Six Foot Shelf, and it talks about uh, a doctor from Boston who, in 1837, goes around the Cape to Yerba Buena Island, the forerunner of San Francisco, and describes what it was like during the crossing, as well as what San Francisco was like before the gold rush. It's a very interesting book. All right. Okay, uh, I really am a fan of ships, and so one more ship picture, a very nice black and white uh, picture from 1905. So there was also aerial photography in those days. You didn't have to climb the mast of a ship. Uh, there were balloons. And so uh, here's Boston in 1860 from the air, shot from a balloon. Uh, another aerial picture, this one presumably from an airplane, though I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I guess it could have actually been from the top of the new Empire State Building. There was maybe still under construction. I'd have to go back and check my, my years. Uh, new York at night. Hopefully, so hopefully this is a winter shot <laughs> because all the windows are ablaze and it's dark outside. Maybe they didn't worry about electricity prices. But it's a beautiful photograph. So tall buildings. Uh, remember, I'm an architect. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Chrysler building. It's an interesting shot. It looks like it's um, shot with a shifted um, lens versus film plane uh, because there's no vertical vanishing point. And uh, the one on the right is Margaret Bourke White, who we'll see several more times during this lecture. Uh, atop the Chrysler building, she's actually climbed out of one of the gargoyles or the grotesques on the top of the building. Uh, I th so this picture looks like it was taken before those gargoyles were added. Here they are, here. She was a, a very brave woman photographer. Here's the tallest building in the world now. So they did some interesting tricks here. Uh, notice that there's no spire on the top. He actually, uh, the architect, uh, William Van Allen, hid the spire in a warehouse until the last minute because they were in a competition with another building to see which would be the tallest in the world. And he brought it out, and it was very tall and pointy, and yeah, we're the tallest. But only for a very short time, because then the Empire State Building eclipsed it just a few years later. Of course, the tallest now is the Burj uh, uh, Khalifa. So they did the same trick. Um, a lot of it, the very top is not habitable. It's just tall. So there are only 160 of the 200 stories that are habitable. So the height, I think this is 1,000... 50, and the height here is 2,717 feet. It's very tall. Uh, people, yeah, people, uh, John McNally's rooftop shot. It, it seems to be a genre of people sneaking up onto roofs with or without permission, right, and taking uh, amazing pictures. Yes, I have. So, um, a little bit more on the art side of documenting industry. There were a lot of photographers who found the aesthetic appealing. Uh, Charles Sheeler is one of them. And this is a composition that you almost couldn't have come up with a better one had you designed the scene with the strong diagonals and the, the balancing vertical elements. It's a spectacular composition. So he did a lot of that kind of photography and then sometimes used it uh, as a guide for his own paintings. So we'll come back to these two pictures later in the course when we talk about post-processing and tone mapping because he does some tricks here to make it seem like it's very, very bright and sunny. And th it's worth talking about those. So we'll come back to that. Um, Lewis Hine is another famous photographer of the industrial aesthetic. It does look like a posed picture, but it's still uh, a gorgeous one. And one more example, back to Margaret Bourke White, uh, the Fort Peck Dam. So I show this picture, first of all, because it's a very nice picture. Um, Reminds me of Zalman's bathrooms, uh, Zalman's uh, vertical uh, <laughs> picture of bathrooms. <laughs> Did you have this in mind when you took those pictures? Uh, I've seen the shot before, but not. Right. Like so this shot is famous 
because it's a nice picture, because it's Margaret Bourke White, but also because it was the front cover of the first issue of Life magazine. Life magazine was the preeminent photography-centric news magazine of the 20th century. And when I was a child, this is how I got my images of the world, uh, was through Life magazine. It wasn't 10 cents when I was a child. Uh, all right. So, scientific uses of photography. So I've already shown you some aerial photography. Let's talk about freezing motion. And uh, an obvious example, especially since I usually show these slides to Stanford students, is to talk about Moybridge. Uh, it was definitely a collaboration. Moybridge and his horsemen friends were arguing about whether a horse's hooves leave the ground during a gallop. And so he commissioned Moybridge to try to do a scientific experiment using photography. And Moybridge designed this system of uh, tripwires at Stanford. Uh, it, he did a number of experiments over six years in Palo Alto and Sacramento, only with an interruption in the middle when he was tried for the murder of his wife's lover, <laughs> for which he was acquitted as justifiable homicide. No comment. Uh, so here's his system, tripwires with separate cameras. And then he would put those photographs together into some kind of collage. Here's a diagrammatic representation of his seminal uh, experiment. And as you can see, the horse's hooves do leave the ground. Here's the actual photograph, or an actual photograph from a similar experiment. During a gallop, the horse's hooves at one point are completely off the ground. He did lots of You kind of see that here, but it slowed down, of course, relative to the gallop. What shutter speed did he have to get to freeze the Oh, that's a good question. What shutter speed? I don't know the answer. I don't have it written down. Sorry. I'll look it up. But can you, you think today, if you do continue with shooting on a NFR, you can get it? Um, I, would, I would guess that you'd need a pretty short shutter speed to freeze that motion. I will look it up, and I'll post it as a sticky on the lecture notes. Myself a note. All right, so. Moybridge. Shutter speed. Uh, while I'm at it, let me check the dory. I think I, yeah, who came up with the idea? I think Stanford actually was. One of his engineers apparently came up with it. Right. Moy Moybridge. And Moybridge kind of claimed it, right? Yeah, it's, it's so, crazy. Uh, so there are uh, two entries here on the dory. Um, Katie Stoy says the grapes example of a platinum print is a Photoshop job, not a digitized image of a platinum print. Uh oh. Link has an example of a portrait of Picasso. Uh, wow. All right. It's amazing, after this many years of teaching this class, there are still corrections that are made to my lectures all the time. Grape? Picture is fake. Uh, all right. I will correct that. Um, Picasso. Well, the prints are still cool. The point still stands, right? Yeah, of course, the point still stands, but I, I like to get everything correct. All right. Uh, and then Peter Sherman says, for those interested in the history of the Kodak DSC camera, and there's a link. I'll post that link uh, in a sticky. Okay. Uh, Thomas Eakins also did a lot of these um, stop motion studies. And here's one of someone uh, pole jumping. This is the same Eakins who did the nude swimmers and then the picture. He uh, did many documentations of science in general. Here is a documentation of a surgical procedure um, from about the same era. It's a kind of an interesting painting. Uh, she's not dead. She's undergoing a mastectomy. Um, but it's not a sterile operating environment, to say the least. Those are medical students um, in observation and uh, a physician narrating the surgery. This is fortunately after the invention of anesthetic, um, it, which was 1846, I think, Ether, William Morton. Um, and also after the invention of antiseptic by Lister 
1867, but still was not a, an antiseptic environment. Okay, uh, Etienne Jules Marais uh, did a lot of studies as well of um, stop motion. This is a falling cat to see if they really do land on their feet. <laughs> Poor cat. Uh, they do seem to, and as a matter of fact, it kind of stretches itself out in order to absorb the, the impact. And he had a photographic gun <laughs> that he used to uh, take pictures of birds. And so one thing you can see, of course, is that he would have had a limited number of shots that he could take at once. And then he would have to switch that out for another uh, disc of film, which he presumably carried in this pouch that looks like powder and ammunition. It was 12 frames per second. No, I think it just took photographs. <laughs> it had lenses probably in that barrel. No, 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 no. It had lenses in that barrel. Uh, okay, so we should talk about cinematography as well while we're doing uh, history here. So Moybridge's images could be viewed using a zoopraxis scope that he invented. Um, so it isn't enough just to have this rotating disc here. You also need a way of only showing uh, a picture every once in a while so that you get a, a perceptive animation. And so he needed a shutter that opened and closed very quickly. But it's only a disc. The, um, the co-invention of the continuous celluloid um, photograph was made by Edison and uh, some French guys that I'll talk about in a second. Um, so Edison called his camera the uh, kinetograph and his playback device, the kinetoscope. And it's essentially the same standard that we use now. It's the same 35 millimeter film that would be in a, in a 35 millimeter still camera, but held the other way. And he invented this idea of perforations and the pull down. The only thing he, that's here that wouldn't have been in his invention was the optical soundtrack which is along there. He wasn't doing that. Uh, intermittent pull down at 30 frames per second. The pull down wasn't very fast, which is why there was temporal aliasing, which we already talked about earlier in the course, um, because it couldn't be open for that long because the pull down was slow. And so here's the first movie. Fred Ott's sneeze. He's slow sneeze. Uh, so the French guys were the Lumiere brothers in France. And it was essentially the same system. Didn't come up with the same standard that Edison used and that's now popular. But here's a movie that they made uh, about the same time of workers leaving the Lumiere factory. So they, um, although their name means light in French, or uh, uh, they were a photographic firm. It's a coincidence of names. Okay, so let's talk about photography as a social tool. So photography was recognized very early as a, a force for social change. I showed you Ray Lander's uh, Two Ways of Life. Remember that? The collage. Um, and it was social conscience was awakened by Europeans, uh, by Europe's colonial possessions. So Napoleon in Egypt or uh, the British Raj or the French in North Africa um, or uh, the Spanish in Cuba, and they saw a lot of uh, poor uh, poverty, and they had government-funded projects to document the ethnic groups and to uh, lobby for donations to improve them. So expanded to economic hardship in Europe and America, brought about by industrialization, we'll get to that, and uh, gave impetus to the reform movements of the late 19th century, uh, which we'll talk about as well. So from a photographic technology point of view, how this uh, threads with the history of photography is you couldn't really do this right without paper film because you needed to go into places and take quick pictures. And so paper film really enabled this kind of documentation. Uh, and you needed the printing press in order to mass produce it so that you could make an effect on people's opinions with these photographs. And so here are some recordings uh, from the 19th century of non-European cultures. These are Syrian uh, refugees, actually, um, but much earlier. Uh, they were called Bedouins at the time, 1870. So this is before uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, um, and before the French Mandate of 1917. 
This is one of the British relief programs in India. So uh, uh, Rangabad is near Hyderabad, I believe. And so this is the before shot, and here's the after shot. Not necessarily the same boys or the same setting exactly, but the comparison is fairly clear of the point they were trying to make about their relief programs. Uh, advertising social programs at home. So the caption here, in case you can't read it, says, once a little vagrant, now a little workman. So upright, Victorian, moral, social agenda. So the progressive era was a gradual transition from a uh, religious charity to a social organization and a gradual realization that the urban poor didn't arise from some sort of moral deprivation, but from economic hardship. And a lot of it was brought on by industrialization. And a seminal work uh, in this regard was Jacob Rees's book in 1890, How the Other Half Lives, about the tenements of New York. There's a great museum called the Tenement Museum in downtown New York City, if you ever have a chance to go there. Of course, they sell this book there. Uh, here's one of his pictures, Bandit's Roost. I don't think I would uh, wander into this alley. Looks like a mean bunch of guys. Five cent lodgings in uh, downtown New York, the immigrant ghettos. So this has uh, personal meaning for me because my grandparents lived in places like that uh, when they came across on uh, this sh ship. And uh, sorry, my great grandparents and um, my grandparents as small children. And so there is my grandfather on the ship's manifest. Uh, these columns are hilarious. You see somewhere here it says, uh, can um, read, can write, um, ever been in prison, whether a polygamist, whether an anarchist. Oh yeah, they ask you whether you're an anarchist? They ask you if you're a communist. A communist. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> Looks a little like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> He's from the same area, Belarus, p southern Poland. All right, child labor. So uh, these boys are not actually breaking up coal, but they are separating the slate from the coal. Uh, they often work 14 to 16 hour shifts in this famous picture by Lewis Hine. That's the same Lewis Hine who was doing the, the work with a uh, large uh, wrench that I showed you before. And here's another picture by Lewis Hine. So the history here is kind of interesting. This is an extremely famous photograph and also a great example of shallow depth of field. So let's see and get the dates right. In 1904, the National Child uh, Labor Committee was formed at a mass meeting in New York City. Um, driven largely by women. Uh, they hired Lewis Hine, who was a teacher and photographer, to document child labor. This is one of the pictures that he took. But child labor was so embedded into the industries of many states that it was, who competed then on the basis of that cheap labor, that resistance to reform was uh, pretty fierce. In 1916, the Keating Owen Act, signed by Woodrow Wilson, prohibited interstate commerce in goods that had been built, uh, had been made using child labor. But it was struck down two years later uh, by the Supreme Court, who argued that Congress had overstepped its authority. 1924, there was a child labor amendment, but it was never ratified by the, the two thirds of the states. Finally, in 1938, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act. It prohibited, it's the same rules that we operate under now, prohibited um, labor by children under the age of 16 and established a minimum wage. But the photography was critical in the history of this and this, fam this photograph is perhaps the most famous among them. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else on the jewelry. Yeah, it's a cotton mill in North Carolina, of which there are still many, but not as many as there used to be because a lot of it's moved to China at this point. I guess those are spindles there, and they're spinning cotton into yarn, would be my guess of what's going on right here. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the Great Depression. Begin to get our way toward the the Farm Service Administration. So um, presumably all of you know, uh, if you went to um, uh, high school in the United States, 
the history of the Great Depression, uncontrolled stock market, unregulated banks, inequitable distribution of income. Hmm, sounds kind of like today, doesn't it? <laughs> Agricultural collapse caused by uh, misuse of marginal farm. Hmm, this is beginning to scary. Milestone was the October 1929 stock market crash, although the market didn't bottom out until 1933. Uh, bank failures, unemployment, labor unrest, agricultural hardship, uh, a drought as well, which will be relevant in a moment. Um, so in the great, they were calling the Great Recession almost like the Depression. No. <laughs> We didn't have bread lines like this in the Great Recession of, uh, 19, of 2008, 2007, 2009. A lot of dramatic photographs, famous photographs. This is Margaret Burke White again of uh, rural poverty in Arkansas. And another picture by her. So this is actually not unemployment. Uh, this is flood. This was a, a flood uh, in Kentucky. But the juxtaposition with uh, bul the billboard behind is obviously intentional. Okay, so let's talk about the Dust Bowl. So to set a little bit of historical background, uh, in 1870s there were cattle drivers from Texas that were bringing their cattle up to the railroad, which was at that point the trans first con transcontinental railroad being built up here. And so one of the most famous of those was the Goodnight Loving Trail that went up to the railhead at Cheyenne. So that's not a funny name. It happens to be two guys named Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving that pioneered that trail in 1866 to reach where the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, had, had uh, reached at that point. Uh, Loving was killed by Comanche Indians in 1867. Uh, but there are many famous historical photographs from along the Cowboy Trail. There's a chuck wagon a little bit further north, South Dakota, a little bit later as well. So a second part of the prequel here is that the American buffalo is hunted to extinction. Uh, here it's shrinking ranges and some historical photographs. So they were hunted first for their skins, but then they were deliberately hunted, or the hunting of them was encouraged in order to weaken the Indian population by robbing them of their major food supply, of the Plains Indians. And so here's a pile of buffalo skulls. So the Indian Wars, the Comanches confined to reservations, this was their original range in 1850. Actually, they had already been decimated to a large extent by smallpox, as were many of the native peoples. Um, and then by the extermination of the buffalo, clashes with the army throughout the mid-1800s, and then eventually confined to a small reservation in Oklahoma, and led to this very famous photograph. Um, it is 1904. Remember uh, the lecture on the history of photography as an art? This is the pictorialist era. And this is a pictorialist manipulated photograph that is intended deliberately to look sort of like an impressionist painting. But it's a very sort of haunting, dramatic painting, uh, photograph. Comanche warriors, a little bit earlier. Okay, so the last part of this prequel is what happened in agriculture which is that settlers were encouraged to plow and plant on the high plains to bust the sod, the, the dirt root matrix that was holding back the soil so that they could plow it under. And uh, the theory was that rain will follow the plow. So that's an interesting theory. <laughs> Let's uh, look at... Um, uh, so climate science from Iowa goes way back. Climate... <laughs> <laughs> Zalman says climate, <laughs> climate science denial goes way back. Um, so here is a rainfall in inches across the United States. And look what happens in the middle of the country. There's a very strong line at the 100th meridian. And where rainfall falls below 20 inches, it is impossible to grow crops successfully without irrigation. And so that falls right in the middle of the area that we're talking about, right near the panhandle of Oklahoma. So um, what you had to build as a house on those prairies 
you couldn't build a log cabin. There weren't trees. You could build a sod house of the sod that you were busting up. So the Dust Bowl. Uh, here's an, um, a picture by Dorothea Lang called Tractored Out. So I have to explain that a little bit. The invention of gasoline tractors meant that it was possible to bust the sod and to uh, plow uh, and in, in general farm large areas of farmland with fewer people. And so there would be many pictures of an abandoned farmhouse where you didn't need that density of people living there anymore. And so it tractored out literally meant that because of the tractor they were out of business. They were, they were uh, thrown off the land, uh, especially if they were tenants. Um, so nutrient hungry cotton. So can you imagine planting cotton in Oklahoma? Rain follows the plow. Okay. So let me read to you from a book called The Worst Hard Time. On Sunday, Joe and another ranch hand, Ernest, rounded up a few stray head of cattle shooed them over to a camp the wranglers kept along a creek bed. Along the way, they passed a sheep herder from the Legion Ranch, the Giago boy, moving animals. He is too young to be out here alone, Joe thought. The day was clear enough. Joe had decided to sleep outside, though we would get down near freezing at night. Joe was cooking a pot of pinto beans over the fire, lying on his back, whistling away the Sunday afternoon, when he saw birds fly by the camp. They screeched as they headed south, like they were sick or wounded. The cows acted funny as the, boo as the birds moved by. Joe got up and walked over to the horses, which were tied to a stake. Joe's horse was pawing at the ground, nervous and sniffing like he knew something. His tail flickered and snapped with an electric crackle, and the hair on his hide stood up, alive with electricity. Joe had seldom seen the horses so jumpy. He untied the harness and let the horses go. He knew they'd come back. The Lugin Ranch was the only place for miles where an animal could reliably get water and feed. The horses want to run a bit on this glorious day. Let him be. He went back to his early afternoon supper, beans slow cooking over the coals. Joe, his partner said, look at the sky. He turned to the north and saw what looked like the leading edge of a fast-moving cloud. Joe walked up the side of a dry creek bread to get a better look, the spurs on his boots making it hard to move fast. When he got to the top, his heart went into a gallop. An enormous um, formation faced him, a tidal wave of rolling black, just a quarter of a mile away. He slid down the embankment and made for the little shelter on top of his wagon. In an instant, the duster showered down on them, dirt streaming through the fine openings in the little cabin. Joe and Ernest stuffed rags into the openings and reached to find a kerosene lantern. They lit the flame, but it went out. There was not enough oxygen in the space to keep it alive. Joe lay on his stomach, a shirt over his head, the air snapping like gunfire, gunfire coarse sand swirling everywhere. Like other cowboys at the Lugin Ranch, Joe is used to the dirt and the wind, what scared him now was the blackness, as if the sun had been shot out of the sky, and it was cold. So this was the worst dust storm ever. It's called Black Sunday, April 14th, 1935. Let me read you one more section. When the big roller crossed into Kansas, it was reported to be 200 miles wide, with high winds like a tornado turned on its side. In Denver, Temperatures dropped 25 degrees in an hour, and then the city fell into a haze. The sun was blocked. That was just the western edge of the storm. The front end charged into Kansas, carrying soil from four states. Near the town of Hayes, where Germans from Russia had settled 50 years earlier, a small boy who had been playing in the fields with a friend dashed for home. He got lost in the midday blackness. Confused, circled back. The next day he was found dead, suffocated half a mile from home. A telegraph inquiry around 2.30 p.m. came by Morse code from the, north, from the northern Kansas to the railroad depot in Dodge City, about 140 miles northeast of Baca County. Has the storm hit? 
The reply came back a few minutes later, tapped from the Dodge City Depot. My God, here it comes. The Dodge City went black. The front edge of the duster looked 2,000 feet high. Winds were clocked at 65 miles an hour. A few minutes earlier, there had been bright sunshine and a temperature of 81 degrees without a wisp of wind. Drivers turned on their headlights but could not see ahead of them or even see the person sitting next to them. It was like three midnights in a jug, one old nester, one settler, said. Cars died, their systems shorted out by the static. People fled to tornado shelters, fire stations, gyms, church basements. There was a whiff of panic not evident in earlier storms as a fear took hold that the end was near. A woman in Kansas l later said she thought of killing her child to spare the baby the cruelty of Armageddon. A weather bureau station agent wrote in his journal that the duster extended east and west for as far as the eye could see. It was lighter at the top, coal black at the bottom. As it advanced, it seemed to recirculate, picking up fresh dirt and then slamming it down in rolling fashion. The dust from this particular storm on this day extended all the way to Washington, D.C. So, this continued for years and it led to what we now call, or what was then called the Great American Desert. The term Great American Desert is from much earlier. It's from the middle of the uh, 19th century, but it had truly now become a dust bowl, a desert. And uh, we are repeating that again, actually, by irrigating heavily and depleting the, o the Ogallala Aquifer. So needless to say, rain didn't follow the plow. That was a myth, and this was the, uh, the climax to that. And so if you go around this part of Kansas and Oklahoma, and Texas and Nebraska, you'll see many, many houses like this. So these were houses that were abandoned as people basically depopulated this uh, area, fled the region forever. A lot of them moved west to California. They were called the Okies. And that was popularized in John Steinbeck's book in 1939, The Grapes of Wrath. And so they became uh, farm workers in the farms and vineyards of California. So about half a million people fled this area. Here's the front cover of the Grapes of Wrath. So not all people fled. Um, some people stayed behind. The Winslow family founded this small town called Dalton, Kansas, hunkered down during the Dust Bowl years, changed their farming practices afterwards. They rotated their crops. And in particular, they never left plowed ground exposed during the winter when the winds were the highest, because that's what led to that dust bowl year. Um, I know about their practices because many years ago, I married their great granddaughter who built this house. Okay, the Farm Services Administration, we'll finally get to these uh, photographs, created by Franklin Roosevelt um, to, as the resettlement administration because of the dust bowl, um, and to combat rural poverty. Under Roy Stryker, um, who was a professor of economics at Columbia, a number of photographers were assembled and sent out to the Dust Bowl area and the Deep South to document the poverty. And so a lot of uh, famous pho photographers were among them, including Dorothea Lang. Margaret Burke White did not join that group, but she did something parallel. and. So uh, she published a book called You Have Seen Their Faces, uh, also about the South and the, and the Plains. So here are some of the Farm Service Administration photographs. Walker Evans, uh, wife of a cotton sharecropper, which means someone who rents land. Another picture by Walker Evans. These are post um, former slaves of the Petway found, uh, plantation, still living under primitive conditions. And I guess the meat sacks hanging from the tree limbs to be cured are this right there. So 
So I saw this picture when I was a child. I assumed it was a painting. It looks like almost an impressionist painting of the Dust Bowl. It's not. It's a photograph of one of the dust storms. Dorothea Lange, migrant family. And so she writes about this. I think, yeah, living in a trailer. There. I see four children there. And then this is uh, her most famous picture, perhaps, and one of the most iconic pictures in the history of photography. So this uh, woman uh, is, was 32 years old. These are two of her seven children. She had migrated from Oklahoma. She was now picking peas in the Central Valley when this picture was taken. So this picture did help Franklin Roosevelt convinced Congress to pass laws to help uh, these people. So this picture really was uh, instrumental as well as being a famous and a beautiful photograph. And so that's all we have for today. So no lecture on Wednesday. And then we'll start with theory of lighting and reflection on Monday and then continue with lighting for photography next Wednesday.